Hey, good morning. How's everybody? Everybody good? Hey, we're glad that you're here. Hey, I need to make a few announcements to you, so I need you to listen up before uh, we start into the message here. Um, this morning at my pregame ritual at Cracker Barrel, my server comes over and sits down, and we begin to visit. And she begins to visit, and she said, hey, my husband and I are doing okay, but we really need some help. I said, I, I got your gig. I said, you can rest easy. What is it? I said, can you get off on a Friday evening and a Saturday through 2 or 3 o'clock? She said, oh, yeah. I said, good, I need you to come to our marriage conference. It'll be the best marriage counseling you'll ever get. And I said, I promise you that. I said, and I, we have done a lot of marriage conferences. I said, this one will be the best one we've ever done. I'm telling you, it'll be worth the price of admission to go to a breakout session and to hear Jim and Tammy Johnson just teach on how to fight fair. I promise you. Now, here's the deal. This couple that I've invited, they don't go to church anywhere. They don't go anywhere. Now, do you understand what I'm saying when I say they don't go anywhere? You got that? Yeah. Right, I, know, I know it's coming off fall break. Everybody's a little bit sleepy. But you understand that, right? Well, see, they really need some community badly. So you see what happens is a lot of times that we sort of think our marriage is pretty good and we think, I'm not going to come to that marriage conference. I really don't need it. I will promise you that your marriage, no matter how good it is, your marriage needs marriage conference. I promise you that. And see, I've got people, there are people that are coming that you have no idea the state of their marriage. They need some people to connect to. So here's the goal. The goal is to have 100 people sign up today. That'll pretty much fill our conference because of what we've already got signed up. So I need for you to sign up today. You can go online and you can do it. Now, here's, now men, let me just talk to us for just a minute. Most men are the ones who think, ah, I don't need all that stuff. I don't need all that help. Why don't you turn right now and ask your wife if she'd like to go? Seriously, just turn to your wife and say, do you want to go to the marriage conference? Now, if your wife says no, then your wife can just go ahead and you can just know, my wife is obviously not living in God's will. I need to pray for her, all right? So you need to sign up. I don't care how long you've been married. I promise you that you need to go. So at any point, if the message is bad, get your cell phone out and sign up online. That's the first announcement. Here's the second announcement. Okay. What's the goal for marriage conference? How many do we want to have sign up after today? A hundred. Second, second announcement. Because of our 28 days of prayer that we did and the series we did and all of you involved in Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire and reading that book, we have seen that it is really important that we do some things ongoing with prayer. Because you're not careful, you just teach something and all of a sudden it just becomes a passing fad and... Everybody forgets the importance of praying. You would not believe what God has birthed in our church and what God has done in the life of our church. And when you look at it, it is all because of 28 days of prayer and what God has birthed through 28 days of prayer. Therefore, uh, we are starting a prayer ministry on Sunday morning. And this is what it is, is that it is going to be during our service hours. That's a part of it. And it's going to happen when our service starts, the first downbeat of the first worship song. There's going to be a group of people in a room somewhere that we're going to give them a list of things and we're going to ask them to be praying during our services. Now, there's times that we need you and we beg you to come and, be, and, and to serve and to be a part of guest services, to serve our kids, whatever. And by the way, if you're here at the bridge, that's just sort of one of our core values is that we expect you to serve if you call the bridge your home. So we just feel like prayer is such an important thing. And so it's going to start in every service in the downbeat of the worship at the hour that we start in worship. And you'll pray through all that. And when you're done, you come back in here and you can be a part of worship. Now, let me just go and tell you, we are not begging people to do this. Because if it's not your heart, you'll last about two weeks and that'll be about it. Because when you were there, I'm telling you, you are fighting a spiritual battle for a whole lot of people, and it's going to get real old real quickly. So if you want to be a part of that ministry, our executive pastor, Dick Wells, will be right down here after the service. I'm going to ask you to come, give him your information, and you can sign up. 
third announcement, and I'm done, and we'll look at our intro video clip for the message. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, I love you, and I am glad that you're here, but I'm just going to say this. The best service that we have, and I'm not blowing smoke this morning, I'm just telling you. I'm not trying to butter your bread. I'm telling you the truth, right? But you've never heard that, have you? Yeah. So you can tell they're not country folk, can't you? All right? I just want to tell you that the best service we have is the 5 o'clock service. Anybody who comes to the 5 o'clock and has been in one of these hours, I'll tell you. So we want to encourage people to move from this service. We're down a little bit today because of fall break, but we want people to move to the 5 o'clock service. We'd love to have you there, especially if you are a single adult, 18, 19 through 29. We strongly want to encourage that we make that a service for you as well. So that's all my announcements. Everybody got them? Sign up for marriage conference, right? Watch the video clip with me if you would. Hello? Is someone there? <laughs> Hello? Who's there? Oh! <laughs> Woo! It's just you, Bernard. Oh, yes. It's just me, Bernard. <sighs> well, thank you for letting me stay. Look, I wouldn't stay here for more than two minutes and 37 seconds if I were you. We're having the walls and ceiling removed. Wow, that sounds like quite the renovation. I guess I'll, um... Catch a ride down with you, then. <laughs> I kept thinking he was going to do one of his last-minute escapes. Yeah. He was really good at those. Oh, if only the world had a reset button. I've looked into the reset button. The science is impossible. Well, Bernard, I didn't know you had feelings. Are you okay? Metro Man's gone, and now there's no one left to challenge Megamind. Oh, come on, Bernard. As long as there's evil, good will rise up against it. Oh, I wish. I believe someone is going to stand up to Megamind. You really think so? Yeah, it's like they say, heroes aren't born, they're made. Heroes can be made. That's it. All you need are the right ingredients. Yeah. Bravery. Yes. Strength. Of course. Determination. Imperative. And a smidgen of DNA. Oh, with that, anyone can be a hero. Yeah. Oh! Heroes are not born, they are made. Anyone can be a hero. There's not a greater truth about heroes than that. And today we look at an ordinary person that went against all odds to become a hero for an entire nation. You got your Bibles? If you turn them on, I'm in Judges chapter 4 this morning. We'll get there in just a moment. We continue our series, Running with the Giants, and we look at a woman that displayed great leadership to a nation that was in dire need for a hero. And what happens is, is that what makes this hero so unique is that it is a woman. Now, don't get me wrong. In no way am I saying that in today's world, a woman can't be a hero or she can't be a leader. I believe that a woman can be a hero and can be a great leader. But back in biblical times, you hardly ever heard from women because that in, in biblical times, it was unheard of for a woman to lead, especially for a woman to lead a nation. Or for that matter, just to lead anything at all because the society was so dominated by men. So the leader that God raises up during this time is a lady by the name of Deborah. As we continue our series, Running with the Giants, we're going to look at a lady's life today that the characteristics are surely not just for a woman, it's for everybody. And I think that most of us think that a hero's status is reserved for somebody else, someone that has a title. Yet in God's recipe for heroes, it's completely opposite of that. It is a person that is ordinary that becomes a hero to other people. And the lessons that Deborah brings to life to us this morning is all about the word called courage. I don't know if you're in need of that, but I think everybody would like to have a little more courage than they have, especially in their own spiritual life. The things that make them what they ought to be. I think everybody wants some more spiritual courage than they have. This hero 
are going to give us some practical steps, from some practical things about how to have courage. So Judges chapter 4, starting with verse 1, would you stand with me as we read in honor of the Word of God this morning. Thanks for standing. Starting with verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jobin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harasheth, Hagoyim, because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. So she sent for Barak, son of Abinam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera the commander of Jobin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will be not yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. So, how do we allow God to give us courage? In our spiritual journey, how does that, what does that look like? How does that take place? And so, I'm going to give you three declarations as we talk about courage today. Pray with me, would you? God, I pray today that we are encouraged by the Word of God and by the story that we see and about this series called Running with the Giants. And, oh, God, I pray that today that people would walk out today with more spiritual courage than they had when they walked in today. So, God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody says, amen. God bless you. You can have a seat. Hey, as I start talking about these three declarations this morning, I want to encourage you to take some notes. If you don't have a journal, you can pull, you can pull out the, the little note card there. It's in front of you, uh, in the seat back in front of you. But we're going to talk about three declarations to have courage. The first, declar the, the first declaration regarding courage, we need, to have, we need to have confidence in respecting ourselves. I think there's a lot of wavering when it comes to this declaration. Because usually our respect is about what other people think about us, whether that's positive respect or negative respect. I would even tell you that I can see this in my own life every Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning, I'm, I'm always asking the same question as I'm walking out of here. And that is, okay, how well am I doing as a leader? I mean, am I really doing that well? How, how well did I do when I was preaching? How badly did I butcher the English language when I was preaching this morning? Because I know that when I go to my car, and, my, and if I have butchered the English language, I'm going as soon as I get in the car, my wife is going to say to me, and she's going to have this kind of sheepish grin on her face, and at that point, I know that I've done something that ha that's not right. And so she'll look at me, and she'll say, do you have any idea what you said this morning? I go, no, I really don't. Oh, boy, you butchered the English language today. And so I'm thinking, how badly am I going to butcher the English language when I preach? Did I even hit the target? Why do more people not come into church? Is that my fault? Rarely do I ask the question, did I give my best to God? I rarely ask that question. And I'm just being transparent with you. And I think that if we truly want respect from others, it starts with respecting ourselves. So, how do we respect ourselves? Let's look at the self-respect that Deborah possessed. At this time, Israel is dominated by a king by the name of Jobin, who had a guy by the name of Sisera that commanded 
900 chariots. Now, understand, you talk about a chariot, that's showing great military power. When people would ask, okay, how do you know how strong the nation is? How many horses and how many chariots do they possess? This guy had 900 chariots. One chariot equaled 15 foot soldiers. Pretty, pretty strong here. So God directs Deborah to enlist a guy by the name of Barak who gathers 10,000 foot soldiers. Deborah tells Barak how to attack, where to attack, and when to attack. And Barak's not really sure that he wants to do this. And so he says, I I'll do this. But obviously he sees leadership qualities and courage in Deborah's life. And he says, I'll go, but I'm not going to go without you. And Deborah says, okay, I'll go. But you need to understand that the honor of Israel winning the army, the, the, the Lord is going to receive the glory, but the honor is going to go to the woman. Deborah respected herself because she followed godly convictions. Now, we don't really hear a lot today in today's world about having convictions. You know, a conviction is something that is a fixed belief in your life, something that you don't move on, that you don't move in changing times, that you said, this is my conviction. In other words, I'm not moving on that. It is a fixed belief in my life. So if we have godly convictions, convictions that honor God, then we respect ourselves. Now, the reason that works that way is because when we respect ourselves and we want to honor God, our goal is to honor God with our lives and not to honor everybody else around us. And so what happens is, is that, and, and I want you to understand, don't fall off the wagon on this one with me, okay? Because this, this is what we do. We say, I do have convictions. I have firm convictions. And my convictions are, I'm going to do whatever I want to. I'm going to date whoever I want to. I'm going to marry whoever I want to. I'm going to have sex with anybody that I want to. I'm going to live with the person that I want to live with before I'm married. Before I'm married, I'm going to do whatever I want to with my finances. I'm going to treat my spouse however I want to treat her. I'm not going to raise my kids in the instructions of the Lord. I'm not going to show my kids that I have godly, fixed convictions in my life. That might be your convictions. Those are not God's convictions. And so we have to understand this morning that self-respect starts with honoring a God. Now, the reason that's so important to understand is that every person is born with a hole in the soul of your life that you're going to fill it with something. You're going to fill it with what other people think, and you're going to honor them, or we choose to say, I'm going to honor God. So self-respect starts with honoring God. So we respect ourselves by honoring God's convictions. And so we respect ourselves, but also it drives us to do what Deborah did. That is that we respect others as well. Deborah, Deborah contributed to the success of others. She gave Israel a commander. She gave Israel resources. She respected this guy by the name of Barak, who was her commander-in-chief. She didn't berate him. She didn't attempt to take over for him. She supported him, and she gave God the credit for the victory. But I'm afraid that we have little respect for ourselves because we spend so much of our time in attempting to please others around us. And we never value this, this thing. This, we never have this declaration in our life of respecting ourselves. It's like if I were to walk up to somebody and I were to say to them, Hey, that sweater that you're wearing, man, that looks great on you. I mean, you are wearing that really well. That shirt you have on, dude, that's a great looking shirt. You look really good in this. Oh, I'm just going to tell you, I, you know what? I don't have any idea. I think I got this thing at the Target sale after Christmas, and I was on the bargain rack, and I paid $4.99. I just grabbed it out of the closet. I, ain't, I hadn't worn it in five years. It's a crazy, nasty thing. I didn't ask you where you bought the blouse or the sweater. I didn't ask you if you thought it was any good. I just said, you look good in a sweater. So let's just say, thank you. Oh, honey, I, your hair looks so good. Well, 
bro, you're, the, wherever you go to get your hair cut, it looks good. Oh, I'm going to tell you, my hair's a mess. I haven't seen my hairdresser. I ain't seen my barber in three weeks. I can't get a hold of them. I think they've gone on a cruise while they're on, on fall break. I can't find them anywhere. I mean, it's a mess. I didn't ask you wh- who your hairdresser was or where, what, what status your barber was. I just says, your hair looks good. So can we not just own that and say, thank you? You know, I think the reason that we don't ever say thank you is that because we don't believe it. Because, see, we live our lives wanting the respect of others, and we don't understand when God says, you are my masterpiece. Do you understand today that even if you're living in some kind of sin and you know that it's wrong and maybe you don't even know it's wrong, but other people have told you it's wrong and you're living in some bad sin and you've been living it for a while and, and God is the furthest thing from your mind, do you understand that even on this, in this very second day, God is screaming at you, you are still my masterpiece. We don't see that. We don't have respect for ourselves. Because we're consumed with what others think about us. So the first declaration is we need to be confident in respecting ourselves. The second declaration regarding courage, we need to be secure in communicating potential to others. Now, you guys back there on the screen, after I read the text, make sure and put that declaration back on the screen for me if you would. But... Judges chapter 4, starting with verse 10, it says, There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Now Eber, the, the Kenite, had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zenanim near Kadesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of, of Abinam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Harasheth Hagoyim to the Kashan River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. Not only did Barak, Did she tell Barak, this is your battle? She communicated to him, this is the potential that I see in your life. Go back to chapter 4, verse 14. This is what it says. Then Deborah said to Barak, go, this is a day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. This is the day. In other words, I see the potential in you. You are the person God's called for the moment. Go. Just like Mordecai told Esther in the first week that we did running with the giants, when he said to her, for such a time as this, this is your day. I, and, and God had called Deborah to show him, to give him the potential that she saw in him. This is your day. I can see this in your life. You can do this. Now, don't miss this. Coupled with her communicating the potential she saw in him. Don't miss this. She now gives the truth that backs up the potential she saw in him. Go to the last part of verse 14. It says, the Lord has gone ahead of you. See, you know what Deborah did? She said, I'm going to battle with you. But if you study Judges 4, she never went into battle. She was like the administrator. She was like the person giving the orders here. She looked at Brock and she said, hey, I want you to know, I'm not going to battle with you, but you're not going alone. Are you tracking with me here? Some of you are already there, aren't you? (laughs) You're not going alone because God's going to go before you. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time that you specifically looked at somebody and said to them, You know, this thing in your life, you can do this. I'm telling you, God has given you everything in your life to accomplish this. You can do this. When's the last time you did that? That's exactly what she did. 
the reason that many people never step out to experience God's potential in their own life, and be honest, is because no one has communicated potential to them. This is why. Especially in the South, we are so stuck on being spiritually comfortable in our own life that we can't even see that God might have a potential in our life that we never ever could dream about having. So if we don't see the potential of what God wants to do in our life and this amazing thing that God wants to do in our life, how in God's name would we ever, ever communicate potential to somebody else if we can't even see what God's trying to do in our life? Amen? And so it has to happen in our life. But see, here's what you got to understand. This same Jesus in the New Testament, I think this is where we get confused. We, we think we see all these kind of miracles that Jesus did in the New Testament, and we just sort of think, well, that was back then. That ain't today. What? The same Jesus that drove out the demons of hell out of people's life in the New Testament is the same Jesus that drives out the demons of hell today. But see, we don't see that because we just, oh, that's just sort of the way we are. No, the deal is we have become so spiritually comfortable that we don't see the potential that God has for us, has in us. And you know what? You're saying right now, well, you don't understand my stuff. I mean, I got all this stuff going on. God knows you got all this stuff going on. Matter of fact, can I just go ahead and tell you this? In the potential that God sees in you, wherever you are, and all the stuff you've got going on in your life, before you ever got to the bad stuff, God was already there present with you. How come there's four of y'all clapping on that deal? Y'all don't have to get with the program. I'm just telling you, all right? So you see what happens is, is that he's called us to do this, but the same Jesus that healed the sick, made the deaf to hear, raised the dead, that's the same Jesus that you live for today. I don't care what you got. The name of Jesus. Just say that name. One, two, three. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Say it one more time. Jesus. That name changes everything. And yet, what happens is that we have to decide if we're going to hear it. Are you communicating the potential to other people? Are you, letting, are you allowing God to do that in your own life? Are you allowing other people to speak spiritual potential into your own life? I want you to know something. Everything that God has ever accomplished in my life, everything, is because God used somebody to come alongside of me and said, Phil, you can do this. I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to be real honest with you. I didn't think I'd ever get out of high school. I've told you all before this, and you're going to think, when I say this, you're going to go, oh, no wonder he butchers the English language. <laughs> First time I took my ACT test, I made a nine on it. They don't even let people get out of high school that make a nine on their ACT. Amen. And I took it again. Oh, I did a lot better. I made 16 this time. <laughs> Dude, we were ready. We were, I'm going to tell you, we never drank, but we were ready to drink on that day to celebrate. I'm just telling you. 16, oh man, Phil has arrived. It's good. I went to college and I thought, I, I mean, I was a, I, my first, we didn't have semesters in college. We had quarters back then. We had three quarters. And I, I'm just going to tell you, ooh, <laughs> my first quarter, I had a 1.4. And we weren't on a 3.0 grading scale either. And I never forget going home. And crying to my mom and dad saying, I, I, I can't do this. My dad looked at me and says, okay. You see your granddaddy saying this, can't you? I said, okay. Dry your tears up. Let me talk to you. You know, God's called you in ministry. I know that. Without a doubt. That's the only thing I ever wanted. Starting my senior year in high school, I, I knew God called me to ministry. That's the only thing that I ever wanted to do. See, so, you know God's called you to ministry? Yeah. 
He knows you've got to get out of college. He knows you've got to go to seminary. You've got to get out of seminary. And I'm thinking, how in God's name am I going to get out of college? How am I ever going to make it in a graduate level of theological studies? I'll never get out of that. God knows that. I tell you what you do. You just do your best. Give the rest of it to God. And I'm going to tell you something. When I graduated college with a 2.8, it was like, God, Jesus has parted the Red Sea here. <laughs> when I was an intern at one of the greatest churches in America for three different summers, I had a youth minister there by the name of Rick Blythe who looked at me and said, Phil, I want you to listen to me. I don't know what your goal is. If you keep your hearts pure, you could be one of the greatest youth pastors in America. I didn't know what that looked like. But all I knew is that somebody told me I could do this. I had an uncle by the name of Uncle Earl Taylor. He was an evangelist. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, when I tell you that he, he was so much a preacher back in the day, he mowed his grass in a suit and tie. I'm not kidding you. I'm not lying to you. He had that white hair. I mean, big, fluffy, just flowing white hair. And I mean, he would get up. And when I would go to hear him preach, he had preached on heaven and hell. And all honesty, when he preached on hell, he was like, he was kind of sad that people weren't going to die and go to hell, you know. It was that kind of preaching. Some of you remember that, don't you, that hellfire brimstone and oh, my goodness. And I knew when he would come and hear me preach as a young kid, he would look at me and he would wrap his big old arms around me and he would look at me and he goes, just keep preaching, son. Everything in my life, everything, it still happens today is because somebody somewhere told me, you can do this. Uh, appreciate that you're clapping for me that I just got out of high school. Thank you very much for doing that. But I want you to listen to me. Some of you, you, you are deeply wounded today. You've got a lot of hurts, and this is what we do. When we get hurt, we sort of step back and we go, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you where God really shows your potential is even when you're wounded, you keep encouraging and showing other people the potential they have in their life. Here's a third declaration regarding courage. Now, you need to write this one down because this is a good one, all right? We need to remain unafraid as we face our fears that keep others in bondage. I think most of us today that we don't face our fears and we have courage, and this is why. We see the bondage in other people's life that they don't have any courage in their life, and we think, well, they can't get out of it. Who am I to think I could ever get out of it? Many times in our lives, we need a change that involves facing a fear and challenging a foe. I got three things that we on the screen. I'm going to tell you, if you can't write them down, get your cell phone out, take a picture of it, because it's, it's worth having here, okay? Number one, what fears might God be calling us to face? When I think of fears, I think of the internal fears. Things that really wreck us that we sometimes don't even tell anybody about, about our own insecurities, about our anger, about our anxiety, those kind of fears. So what fears might be calling God calling us to face today? The second thing is this. What foes might God be calling us to challenge? I think of foes as external things, like other people in our life, like our finances, like our jobs, those kind of things. But here's a third question, and here's the most important one. What changes does God want us to make in our lives? You see, to commit to step out in faith and obedience and to face our fears, it's going to require us to have courage. Now, let me tell you something, okay? This is what happens to us. It was the same thing that Deborah was facing and all the judges faced and all these prophets faced in the Old Testament because the law of Israel, now write this one down. It's worth writing down. The, the Israelites, they were living in a law that we are living in today. It is called the law of repetitiveness. It's a law of repetitiveness. And let me show you how 
let me show you how this happens. Israel, they begin to worship God. They would experience freedom. And then other nations around them, their neighbors, they begin to worship other gods. And so then Israel would leave worshiping the true God, and then they would join in in worshiping other gods. And the next thing that happens is they would live in bondage. And then they would fall captive to the enemy. Are you tracking with me? They would fall captive to the enemy. God would discipline them, discipline them because of their sin. And then they would cry out to God. Because they realize, I don't have any other thing I can do. I've gone as low as I can. I'm in bondage, and that's where some of you are today. You're in bondage to the enemy, and the enemy is wearing you out. And at one time, you had freedom in your life, and God was doing great things in your life. And boy, there was so much freedom, and all of a sudden, you begin to do what all of your neighbors did, and you begin to live in the same bondage that they lived in. And because you see it in their life, you think, oh gosh, I can't ever have courage because, I mean, if they are going to live in it, I'm going to live in it. And so what we do is we do what we see other people do. And then when that takes place in our life, we begin to live in our bondage. And then we finally get to the point and we get so low that we finally go, oh God, I'm crying out to you. That's what Israel did. That's what we do. We cry out to God. And then guess what happens? God would send them a leader to rescue them. Most of the time, it, here, it was a judge. Most of the times, it was a prophet. They never listened to the prophet or the judges. For a season, they would, but then they wouldn't. It's kind of like us. Somebody speaks it to us, and we go, okay, I need to hear that. I'm going to do that. But then I'm going to go back to what I see all my neighbors do, and I'm going to live in bondage. God would send them a leader to rescue them, and then they would live in freedom. And guess what happened? The cycle would start over again, the law of repetitiveness. That's where some of you are. That's where you don't have courage. That's you live, you live in spiritual fear. You're afraid of what God really wants to do in your life. So how do I face my fears? As I wrap up my time with you, how do I face my fears? Number one, we rely on God's promise. Judges chapter 4, verse 6. Go back to that one. She sent for Barak. Son of Abinam from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, what is this? What's the next word? Command. What's the next word? Command. Say it again. Command. Commands you. How much time do we stay in bondage because we don't live in this one principle? And that is, whatever God has told you, do that. Whatever He's telling you, do do that. Don't waver. Whatever he's telling you, don't do that. And this is what I hear people say all the time. Well, I would do that if I only knew what God was telling me. Oh, bull, you know exactly what God's telling you to do for the next step. I got so close to saying a word I shouldn't have said right there. <laughs> Woo, mercy. Oh, man. I'd have, I, I would have been in marriage counseling all week. If I'd have, oh, gosh, you have no idea how close your pastor came to cussing on stage. Right? Oh, Lord, Jesus, let me stop and just thank you that you held me there. And so I'm just going to tell you, is that, see, you do know what God's telling you to do. Whatever he's telling you to do, the next step, make it the right step. For some of you today, it's to give your life to Jesus for the very first time. You've never done that. You've thought about that. You're thinking about that right now, that I've got a hole in my soul and I can't feel it. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, right? But see, we don't do that because we don't want to take the next time. Obey him. Obey the commands of God. Just make that. That's the promise. Rely on God's promise. And do you realize today, you like my new stand I got right here? Doesn't it look good? I sort of feel like Louis Giglio today. Do you realize that all, don't miss this, do you realize that all of God's promises are based on his love for us? 1 John 4.18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. As a Christ follower, the enemies, the demons of hell that are attacking you all the time to get you to live by your flesh and by the world, they're driving you because of 
punishment. They want to punish you. That's not God. God does it because God loves you and cares for you. Everything he's telling you is because of his love for you. You know what it says in scriptures? It says that his kindness leads you to repentance. A daily repentance. Turning from your sins. Having firm beliefs. Having convictions in your life. That you turn from that. Why? Because it's his kindness. Because he knows what is best for us. And he loves us so much. That's what drives everything about him for us. We think, oh, well, I'm not going to do that because God's just out to get me. God's not out to get you. God is for you. He is not against you. As a Christ follower, again, our enemy is about punishing us. That's not what God's about. God's about freeing you up and giving you life. So you rely on God's promise. And secondly, you rely on God's presence. Deborah told her, told her commander to go because the Lord was with him. And that he was already going to, he is going to go before you in the place that causes you to have fear. Now, let me stop for a moment and just say, say this to us. Because I think we need to hear this. Some of you right now, at this present moment, you are living in a crisis of belief in your life. And let me tell you what's taking place in your life. We just came out of the 28 days. How many times I heard somebody say, I've never prayed out loud in church ever, until you challenged me to pray out loud. Why do you pray out loud? Because God, and even in Acts, in the church, it says, they lifted their voices together. Oh, sure, God knows what you're, what, what you're already thinking. He already knows that. So why do I pray? Because let me tell you who doesn't know what you're thinking. The demons of hell don't know what you're thinking. So let them know. You understand your position, and this is why I'm calling out to you. I'm God, I'm calling out to you. And I, 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 I want to say this again. I've said this the last several weeks. In your life group, I'm just going to tell you, I think it's great that you discuss. I think it's great that you watch videos, but let me just tell you, life group leaders, you need to challenge your group. You need to make sure that you challenge your group, that people are praying out loud together. Why? Because it is a crisis of belief, and I promise you, what the devil doesn't want is for you to be a prayer that you are praying out loud. So while I love the guides, I love your discussion, all that's good, I'm going to tell you, where you're going to have spiritual courage is where you learn to unleash the power that the Spirit of God has in you, and that is in your own prayer life. Pray out loud. Boy, pray out loud. Challenge people to pray out loud. See, if we don't challenge people, we continue. We just live in the spiritual comfort that we have. So the results of courage is that it affects people around us. Our daughter, Daria, and her husband, Matt, Scott Parker, Christine Hampton, they took a group of students to Costa Rica and just got back on Friday. So you went, huh? <laughs> so they went, and uh, we had the joy that starting on Friday uh, for four nights, we got to keep Lydia and Levi. Well, Lydia, our five-year-old, she, uh, she got a bicycle for her, for her birthday. So her bike's at our house, and... Um, her other granddad, Hops, Hops gave her the bicycle. Hop and Cece gave her the bicycle. So but we had it because they had the bicycle at their, their uh, school that day, and it was bike day, so they had to take their bikes. And so I look at Lydia, and I say to her, I go, hey, let's go ride your bike. No, Paul, I don't want to ride my bike. I said, no, we're going to go ride your bike. Nope, and Paul, I don't want to ride my bike. I said, let's just walk outside. Paul, I don't want to ride my bike. I said, well, let's just go outside. Paul, I don't want to ride my bike. No, let's go outside. So we go outside and I go, hey, let's get on this bike. Let's ride it. No, Paul, I don't want to. Why do you want to ride? I just don't like to. And she goes, I'm afraid. I said, oh, that's silly. Come on, get on the bike. Let's ride it. She goes, I don't want to ride it. I said, why do you not want to ride it? And she said, because I rode it at school and I fell off of it and I got hurt really bad. I said, you're walking fine. You didn't get hurt really bad. You're fine. Now, the whole time this conversation is going, Levi, two-year-old, and you understand, Lydia is, that, that's, that's Levi's hero, is, 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 is his big sister. And he's just sort of standing off the side, Levi's too. And so he's just sitting there, he's just, he's just listening and watching the conversation. 
And he goes, she goes, I got hurt really bad. Let's just get on it. So we'd get on it. And so when we'd get on the bicycle, on the bike, I'd get behind her. She's got training wheels on it. And I'd just sort of be pushing along in our driveway. And as I'd be pushing along, the first thing I taught her was how to brake. So I would teach her how to brake. And so I did, I'm not sure why her, sorry, parents haven't taught her how to do that yet. But we were doing that. So we're teaching her how to ride and how to brake. And so she got that. And then I said to her, and I said, okay, we'll come up here. Okay, now we we'll get up here and let's sort of turn the bike. And she would, take her, she would take her handlebars and she would turn it as hard as she could. And I said, baby, don't do that because you do that. You're just going to tip over on you. And she goes, okay. So we did it a few more times. She came back up. And this time she turned that handlebars. And when she turned those handlebars, that bike went the other way. Boom, crash. She's laying on the ground. Paul, I told you that I didn't want to ride this bike. She goes, I'm hurt really bad. And Levi's over in the corner going, oh, no. <laughs> and I just said, no, we're going to get back on this bike. No, Paul, I'm not getting on that bike. I'm th I looked at her and I said, quit acting like your mother did when she was a little girl. Get on the bike. Because her expressions are so much like Darian. And I said, get on the bike. And she goes, no, I'm not getting on the bike. I said, no, I'm, Paul's going to show you. So we got back on that bike. And we got back on, on that bike. And the next thing she would do is she'd start pedaling. As she was pedaling, she'd start looking at her pedals. And I said, don't look at your pedals. If you do, you, and she, I said, you don't, know, you don't know how to steer. Don't look at your pedals. Just keep pedaling. Keep pedaling. And so she would pedal. And she got back on there. And she kept riding it. And finally I said, see, look how good you did. You did so good. I'm so proud of you. You were so good. You did so good. And she goes, I said, you want to ride again? Nope. <laughs> and I said, no, we're going to go back on it. We got back on it and we rode on it. And let me just tell you that today there are some of you that you've been falling off your bike for a long time. And you need somebody just to come alongside of you and go, you can do this. Hey, just keep pedaling and keep looking, looking forward. Because I promise you, it's going to be good in the end. You see, Lydia just needed an encourager to tell her, you can do this. You, you can do this. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how, how messed up I am. Daria will tell you. All my kids will tell you. We used, and our, we'd, have back, we'd go somewhere where there was just a big grassy field. And let me tell you how I taught my kids how to ride a bike. I'd get behind them, and they'd start pedaling. I'd go pedal, 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 and then I would just push them as hard as I could push them. And they eventually would keep pedaling, keep pedaling, keep pedaling, and boom, they'd fall. I don't want to do this. No, no, we're doing it again, and we'd do it again. Now, I would teach them, okay, when you start to fall, put your foot out. This is because, see, I would teach them, try to teach them how to fall. And you know what, eventually, you know what would happen? They quit falling. I'm just going to tell you, there's some of you today that you look at your own life and you're saying, I, I really don't have a whole lot of spiritual courage. Let me be the first one to tell you, you can do this. But let me tell all of us here today, you need to be the encourager in somebody else's life to say, hey, dude, keep pedaling the bike. It's going to be good in the end. Now, where does this, where does this courage start with? It starts with you saying, yes, I give my life to Jesus. I'm all in. I give everything to him. I hold nothing back. That's where it starts, of having this relationship with this person by the name of Jesus. So 